Hello and welcome. I'm Joy Williamson Lott, Dean of the University of Washington Graduate School, home of the Office of Public Lectures. I want to thank you for joining us for tonight's Graduate School Public Lecture, An Evening with Joy Harjo. This conversation will be moderated by the Graduate School's own staff member, Patricia Humanik. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the many people and departments who helped make this live stream possible, including UW Communication Leadership, the Population Health Initiative, the Tulsa-based independent bookseller Magic City Books for hosting Joy, and our talented live stream production team and graduate school staff. Thank you. I also want to thank you for your continued loyalty as viewers of these great live streams. We know it's not the same experience as what our in-person lectures offered. One day, we will get to see one another in person, and I know our team in the Office of Public Lectures is really looking forward to seeing you too. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speakers. Joy Harjo is an internationally renowned performer and writer of the Muscogee Creek Nation and was named the 23rd Poet Laureate of the United States in 2019. She is the first Native American to hold that honor. The author of nine books of poetry, several plays and children's books, and a memoir, Crazy Brave. Her many honors include the Ruth Lilly Prize for Lifetime Achievement from the Poetry Foundation, the Academy of American Poets Wallace Stevens Award, a Penn USA Literary Award, Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund Writers Award, a Rasmussen U.S. Artist Fellowship, two NEA Fellowships, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Harjo is Chancellor at the Academy of American Poets and is a founding board member of the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. She lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she is a Tulsa Artist Fellow. Our moderator, Patricia Humanik, daughter of Polish immigrants, is a poet, performance artist, and facilitator. She works in service of underrepresented students, faculty, and staff in the Graduate School's Office of Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity at the University of Washington. Patricia is also events director for The Seventh Wave, a literary nonprofit at the intersection of art and social issues. She holds a BA in creative writing and certificate in peace and conflict studies from the University of Colorado Boulder and an MA in communication from the University of Colorado Denver. Once again, thank you for joining us and enjoy the lecture. Thank you, audience, for spending your evening with us. It is an honor to get to speak with U.S. Poet Laureate Joy Harjo of the Muscogee Creek Nation and to have her wisdom with us tonight. I want to acknowledge that I am on the land of the Coast Salish people, the first people of Seattle, and to honor with gratitude the Duwamish tribe and the land itself, which touches the shared waters of the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I'd like to remind you that you can send questions throughout our conversation to mayiask at uw.edu. Thank you so much, Joy, for being with us. I'm hoping you'll start us off with a poem, Speaking Tree, from your book, Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here with you. I'm here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Muscogee Creek Nation, um, Osage, the meeting of Osage, Muscogee Creek, and uh, Cherokee Nations. Speaking Tree. Mm. And I open, all, open up with a quote from Sandra Cisneros. She wrote me a note saying, um, I had a beautiful dream. I was dancing with the tree. Some things on this earth are unspeakable. Genealogy of the broken, a shy wind threading leaves after a massacre, or the smell of coffee and no one there. Some humans say trees are not sentient beings, but they do not understand poetry. Nor can they hear the singing of trees when they are fed by wind or water music, or hear their cries of anguish when they are broken and bereft. Now I am a woman longing to be a tree planted in a moist, dark earth between sunrise and sunset. I cannot walk through all realms. I carry a yearning I cannot bear alone in the dark. 
What shall I do with all this heartache? The deepest rooted dream of a tree is to walk even just a little ways from the place next to the doorway to the edge of the river of life and drink. I have heard trees talking long after the sun has gone down. Imagine what it would be like to dance close together in this land of water and knowledge, to drink deep what is undrinkable. Mm. Thank you. This poem grounds us in the relational and historical and spiritual aspects of your work. I think Speaking Tree is also grounding for our conversation tonight because it has to do with listening. You've spoken elsewhere about poetry teaching you over the years about listening. In an interview in Time Magazine, you said, you can train your ears to history. You can train your ears to the earth. Can you say more about what poetry has taught you about listening and how? I just finished a memoir that answers that question, mm. <laughs> but uh, you know it's a long, long, it's a long, long story because I've had many teachers and for, I've had many teachers, and this is not the path that I expected. I've always loved music, and my mother wrote songs and uh, wrote you know and ly lyrics and 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 sang the melodies, and that's how I came to love poetry. But growing up. We didn't have like poets in the neighborhood or poets on career day or anything like that. And I loved painting. And that was, I thought, my path because I, um, I liked the quiet and I liked being able to listen mm -hmm. and deep, which of course poetry was one of my teachers. You know, I loved to read poetry when I was younger. So that to become a poet was something I had never, not planned to do. And it's a mystery to me, but mm -hmm. still, but I have had many teachers along the way, some of them other poets, some poets that I knew only in from what they left behind, their tracks of words in, in their books of poetry. And others are teachers, you know, like my first poetry teacher, David Johnson at the <laughs> University of New Mexico and others uh, were the Pacific Ocean or John Coltrane or I had, you know, many teachers and ultimately poetry, I think, or maybe any art or maybe even being a human is about listening, listening beyond. And artists always listen and look beyond what, uh, what is known, the known world, whether it's seen, heard, or tasted, so to speak. Mm. I love that we can look forward to hearing more about that question in your in your forthcoming memoir. Uh, do you have a name for that forthcoming memoir? Yes, it's called Poet Warrior, A Call for Love and Justice. It will be out September 2021 from Norton. Excellent, looking forward to that. Some of how you describe listening in this attention giving that art and poetry offer us feels like a key ingredient to safe spaces, which is one of our anchors for tonight's conversation. And I'm curious to hear more about what does safety in a shared space mean to you? What does a safe space mean? How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I know when I was reading that, I was, I was reading about that kind of theme and I was thinking, well, what I've always told students is in what I tell myself when I'm as an artist, you, you can't feel safe where you are. You're always moving beyond what you know, which always sets up uh, a kind of space of, it's this curiosity of, or of the unknowable. And so you don't always feel comfortable in that space. But what you're speaking about is something a little different. It's the feeling that kind of the freedom to speak out and be who you are, even if you are in a space that is of a different language or culture or place in which, you know, it's, I guess it would be a safe space, would be a space of a diversity of, mm -hmm. um, of difference and the allowance for difference in that. And of course, Audre Lorde speaks, still speaks to us, you know, her words continue mm -hmm. to speak to us about that, about, she was always questioning that space and bringing up the important uh, 
uh, insights about being in a space so that we question ourselves even. And um, mm. I mean, to even write poetry, I, you know, it, it's interesting that it's not that I didn't feel safe to write poetry, it's that I didn't, well, maybe partly when, what, it, it has more to do with even knowing that there was people like me wrote poetry. Hmm. Is it wasn't until mm -hmm. I was involved in native rights movements at the University of New Mexico as a student that I heard really heard native poets. When I went to Indian boarding school, it was a BIA school, but it was an art school, and a lot of students wrote poetry. I think it's something everybody, nearly everybody did just kind of naturally because at that point in the late 60s, most of the students were still within oral cultures or just barely even a generation away. So they were very present, that love mm. of oratory and sound and listening. And so poetry wasn't anything separate. It was just, you know, people, you know, there were writing, I didn't take writing then. And, uh, but it, at the University of New Mexico, native rights movements, and suddenly I was in the presence of like Leslie Silco and James R Welch, and I love James Wright too, James Welch and uh, Simon Ortiz, and suddenly I was in the presence of all these native poets. And that was exciting, that broke open a door, that mm. opened a door to say, wait, you mean we can write poetry? We can be part of this List this conversation, this national, this global conversation that is, you know, I felt fed by poetry, but there was, you know, it could be a participant. I don't know if that's exactly safe space, and poets don't always travel necessarily where there are in a safe space because mm. they're always opening or shifting the spaces in ways that are can be challenging. I love that answer though, because the what you're talking about, like permission to be yourself fully and to s sort of reckon with all the sides of yourself is I think a part of the safe space and diversity that you were speaking to, the, the safety to be among difference. I think that's really a beautiful way of looking at it. And I'm intrigued by what you're speaking to with um, how poets sort of make a space uncomfortable, you were saying. Can you say more about that piece? Well, I think it's the role. I remember as a student at the University of New Mexico thinking, okay, where is, you know, what, if I go to my Muscogee Creek Nation, where do I find poetry? Well, I later discovered, you know, uh, um, we had Alexander Posey, who's featured in our new anthology, but there, the poetry, we, you know, most of it wasn't in books, wasn't in books. And most of it was related to, it took place in our traditional culture, a lot of it. It had to do with more like oratory, oratorical forms, because there's different oratorical forms or in poetry, I mean, in um, song, songs. And I s thought, okay, where in the world can I find um, people writing this kind of poetry, but it's mm. public in English. And that's where I went to, I started my reading, my love of African writers and found Okat B. Patek, who wrote, uh, it's a world classic song of Loino and found inspiration there, which in a way became a crossing point for me of more oral texts and how you know, and then writing poetry in the manner of, say, contemporary American poets who, who you know, I was listening to at, mm. uh, and reading as a student. Mm -hmm. Like Adrienne Rich, who later became a mentor. I remember reading her poetry in a class and, and Denise Lovertoff and, and others. That's so beautiful. I'm excited for us to um, hear more of your poems. Maybe this is a great moment for us to go to your poem from your newer book, An American Sunrise, that is for uh, Adrian Rich, your poem, By the Way. Yes, I wrote this poem. I think I was doing something nearby and I was in a hotel room. Um, I guess a lot of poems start in hotel rooms. And um, 
I was thinking about Adrienne. I remember when she lived on the, I first met her when she lived in Montague, Massachusetts, and then moved to uh, Santa Cruz. Mm. And I wasn't far from where she used to live, and I was thinking about Adrienne and writing to her and just what she taught me. So it's called By the Way for Adrienne Rich. I've given it time as if time were mine to give. There was a dam larger than Hoover or the president or the patent for the metal creature that sucks up all the dust. Words had to stop and ask permission before crossing over. Oh, sometimes they were wild with the urgency of sweet and leaped. Mostly the rest were kept in the net of swallowed or forbidden language. I want to go back and rewrite all the letters. I lied frequently. No, I was not okay. And neither was James Baldwin, though his essays were perfect spinning platters of, comp of comprehension of the fight to assert humanness in a black and white world. That's how blues emerged, by the way. Our spirits needed a way to dance through the heavy mess, the music, a sack that carries the bones of those left alongside the trail of tears when we were forced to leave everything we knew, by the way. I constructed an individual life in the so-called civilized world. We all did, far from the trees and plants who had born and fed us. All I wanted was the music, I would tell you now. Within it, what we cannot carry. I talk about then from a hotel room just miles from your home in the east, before you fled on your personal path of tears to the west, the worn, that worn out American dream dogging your steps. You lived on a pedestal for me then, the driven diver who climbed back up from the abyss, Venus on a seashell with a dagger in her hands. I had to look and followed your tracks in the poems cut by suffering, aren't they all? We're in the apocalyptic age of addiction and forgetting. It's worse now. But that dam, I had to tell you, I broke it open stone by stone. It took a saxophone, flowers, and your words had something to do with it. I can't say exactly how. The trajectory wasn't clean, though it was sure. Does that make sense? Maybe it does only in the precincts of dreams and poetry, not in a country lit for 24 hours a day to keep dreams stuck, turning in a wheel in the houses of money. I read about transcendence, how the light came in through the window of a nearby traveler, and every cell of creation opened its mouth to drink grace. Mm. Beautiful. Your work really resists oversimplification and weaves, you know, as I said in the beginning, it weaves history and a reckoning with yourself and spirituality. There's so much depth to it. And I also read a longing in your work for healing. Um, we're in a time of intensifying climate change and so many struggles for justice and the current pandemic, which is connected to issues of ecological stress. Um, and I read this longing for healing and for those of us, particularly those of us who are non-native here in the United States to awaken to the possibility that we spoke of just earlier of deeper listening, um, deeper listening to other people and across species and for more of us to consider our relationship to place, to the land in which we live. I think your work calls us to do that. And I'm wondering how you see poetry or the arts more broadly as playing a role in in healing or in healing our connection to place, to the land in this country. I think I'm coming to understand that that's probably one of the basic impulses of art, whether it's called explicitly that or not. You know, whether it's composing music or writing poetry or, or painting, that it's all this kind of holographic, a geometrical, mathematical unfolding towards um, adjusting vibration and patterns towards a larger, um, I was going to say knowing, but unknowing. <laughs> it's like mm. sort of towards a larger unknowing. 
and in that it challenges. I mean, a lot of people think healing and it has a certain, you suddenly hear these sweet little sounds and da 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 but <laughs> healing is a rugged adventure. Mm. We're in the middle of it right now in this country and I think in the, in the world, we're in the middle of it and it's ugly. It can be ugly, mm. it can, there's pain, often pain involved and, and eruptions and, uh, and to, to let go. I mean, first you have to clean out, you have to figure out what's there, how it got there in the first place rather than just give, I mean, we've been living in a society that believes in just giving you a pill or, or, um, but real healing, you go, you have to, there's a story in there. <laughs> there's a song that will help you get there. There's plants that um, can help you if you know how to, to be with them or speak with them or, or use them. And I mean, it's, it's, we're in the middle of that in this country and in this, this planet of, mm. uh, of an immense, you know, an immense, uh, certainly an immense wounding and the body, whether it's our human bodies or the earth is always moving towards, or even a music, a song or a poem is always moving, even as it might disrupt, it moves towards towards a place of, of healing, I think. Mm. That reminds me of, you said something along those lines in a different interview, you, you said something like, healing is not always a pretty thing, you have to go through the wound. And I think that's, I think that's so apt for our current moment. It makes me wanna bring us back um, to an earlier work of yours from a book in Mad Love and War that you wrote decades ago. And I'm, I'm thinking about how in your poetry you create a safe space, the kind of spa safe space that you were creating, talking about earlier, where it's not just a space that is a feel-good space, but one where people can show up in their difference. And I think your poetry wrestles with addressing division and hatred head on, but also with a compassionate lens. Maybe you could read to us transformations from in Mad Love and War. Yes, I thought about that poem a lot lately. And the thing I've learned about poetry is that often, I mean, I don't always know what I'm doing. I mean, if I think I know what I'm doing, then I'm in the going in the wrong direction. But you can start out with an impetus or an intent or there's something you don't always know, but you're moving towards something and you get captured by architecture and sound and, and uh, a kind of shape. And this poem was one of those that is still teaching me something. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to figure out how, I mean, like the uses of poetry, like in the Muskogee, you know, in our, in our tradition, you know, there's songs, you got songs to do. Songs can be very useful, just like poems. And I, sometimes I use them uh, interchangeably. They're useful. It can be beautiful and stunning and disturbing and all of the, everything all at once. But, you know, I think about how they're useful, have real use in the world. And of course, we've seen that during the pandemic, people turning back to poetry and mm -hmm. people have always done that with poetry during times of transformation. Uh, there you have poetry. You know, if you're, you're, uh, there's, you know, there's a birth and there's celebration of birth, you turn to poetry. There's a, a marriage, a joining together, poetry, even parting, you know, mm. breakups, a lot of breakup poetry, you know, and, and then death and pondering that other part of the journey. And this poem came out of thinking about how, is it possible like to be an alchemist in a poem and turn hatred into love. Mm. That's what I try to do. This poem is a letter to tell you that I have smelled the hatred you have tried to find me with. You would like to destroy me. Bones splintered in the eye of one you choose to name your enemy won't make it better for you to see. It could take a thousand years if you name it that way, but then to see after all that time, never could anything be so clear. 
memory has many forms. When I think of early winter, I think of a blackbird laughing in the frozen air, guards a piece of light. I saw the whole world caught in that sound. The sun stopped for a moment because of tough belief. I don't know what that has to do with what I'm trying to tell you, except that I know you can turn a poem into something else. This poem could be a bear treading the far northern tundra, smelling the air for sweet alive meat, or a piece of seaweed stumbling in the sea, or a blackbird laughing. What I mean is that hatred can be turned into something else if you have the right words, the right meanings buried in that, most, in that tender place in your heart where the most precious animals live. Down the street, an ambulance has come to rescue an old man who is slowly losing his life. Not many can see that he is already becoming the backyard tree he has tended for years before he moves on. He is not sad, but compassionate for the fears moving around him. That's what I mean to tell you. On the other side of the place you live stands a dark woman. She's been trying to talk to you for years. You have called the same name in the middle of a nightmare from the center of miracles. She is beautiful. This is your hatred back. She loves you. Mm, thank you. I keep contemplating that ending ever since I read that poem. This is your hatred back. She loves you. I think it's such an offering right now. And again, like so much of your work, there's this deeply compassionate lens in the poem. And at the same time, it refuses to silence the truth. There's so much juggling happening there. And I'm curious about, you wrote this poem in, in this book in Mad Love and War decades ago. And I'm wondering if your relationship to, to that book and to your thinking about hatred and division, if it's transformed since you wrote this poem and this book, how has your thinking shifted in terms of considering um, this topic of, of hatred and division? I used to think when I was younger, probably around the time I wrote this poem and before, that we could change everything and we could all, you know, we could change it within the few years of our young lives that, that uh, you know, our work for native rights, women's rights, human rights, the rights for all genders, and that everything would change. And I think it has. I mean, I've watched things change by increments, but things, time, time is a tricky thing. And I think poetry, and that's what's so powerful and why poetry, you cannot freeze time in poetry. I mean, time moves through and you can maybe somewhat capture it, but poetry works with, I think, one of the, uh, is there's a kind of timelessness in it, even if you're dealing with an exact moment or something mm. as an exact memory. Um, so all that to say is that, I mean, the poem could have been written today. <laughs> you know, it could have been, we're still, yeah, we, we're still humans and we're still part of a human tree. There's a field each of us is from a family field. We're all from the earth field of humanity. And things just take to change. It change, change happens. It's how we're always changing, but it happens in increments. Hmm. And we have to be patient at the same time. We have to be vigilant. And the poem reminds me that we still have, we all, you know, we still have a lot of work to do here. So much work be, to do. Yes, we do. I mean, it'd be great to say, oh, okay, we're, we don't have to do that. <laughs> we've, taken, we've taken care of that. I guess we wouldn't be on earth then. No kidding. That feels in dialogue too with um, a poem from, another poem from an, Ameri from an American Sunrise, your newer book that you read that Adrian Rich poem from. And there are some lines you wrote in the poem, The Fight. You write, I grow tired of the heartache of every small and large war passed from generation to generation, 
but it is not in me to give up. And as you speak to just now, you, change takes so much time and you yourself have been a part of struggles for justice and writing about this for so long. I'm curious what anchors you in this dance that you do of honoring both rage and compassion, like what keeps you going? Well, the ancestors do, because I think when, you, when you're when you young, you can see them and you're very aware of their presence and you get older and you're walking toward that doorway and, and they become very evident or woven in, you start to see the weave a little more clearly. Mm. And so then the children, it's like seeing the young people coming up, the young the young poets, the young artists, the young, the children who come in, bearing the the dreams, the unfinished dreams of uh, car carrying their own and the dreams of their ancestors. And, and there's such light and promise. Hmm. And you see it in humans. And when I say humans, there's also the trees, you know, watching the young trees and the animals. It's with all of us. Hmm. It feels like that's that's part of the legacy or the mission that of your role um, as first U.S. Poet Laureate of a Native Nation. Um, I know you've spoken in other interviews about how much this position means to you and the message you want to make clear that Native peoples are still here. And among projects you've been working on during this time is the formidable task of putting together Native Nations anthologies and sort of showing the um, the light you were just talking about of, of future generations and other Native Nations poets. Um, curious if you could tell us more. I know one one of those anthologies came out this year when the light of the world was subdued. Our songs came through, which was a huge project. Is it you were considering um, choosing from over 573 indigenous tribal nations in the mainland United States alone, not to mention the many Native Nations of Alaska and Hawaii. So. I know you have another um, anthology project in the, that you're working on with your second term as U.S. Poet Laureate. Can you tell us more about that project and the process of making these anthologies? Yes, with that project, I felt it was important that America see that Native, that there are Native poets. I'm not the only one. There are many of us. And, and to see us on a map and to see this country as a map without all the politics, without the political delineations. So first, it's going to be a story map on a, a digital map that will be available to anyone in the country, by anyone, if you can click on the website. And on the map will be um, 47. I, there's so many poets, I would like to include even more then in the other anthology and even more, but there's capacity. There's a question of capacity. So we have 47 poets that on this beautiful map of the earth, you just see earth and all the, you know, water and so on. And then you can click on a marker and, and see the, a poet, they talk about place, they read. And to give you a sense of how, you know, our voices and, and the stuff of our poetry really how tight it is to to place and to this country you know as a root beginning and and then what i encourage people to do is to you know add to the map i don't know if they can directly add to that one but you can still take that and then add there's so many other poets i what i wanted to do my <laughs> my initial uh impulse was say wait a minute but every poet is connected to poetry ancestors and um you know, there's old oh, Walt Whitman over there, and there, there's, uh, uh, you've got Ann Bradstreet, you've got Phyllis Wheatley, and there's, I mean, you can start going down this list of poets, and pretty soon you would connect up to, you know, you could see how all the poets in this country hooked up and were related in some way or the other. If you were to really extensively put this map together you would see all the webs of connection. But mm. it's like, well, we have a year. <laughs> we have a year. We have a staff of two, you know. Wow. You know, of two people. And, uh, you know, this is what we can do. But that's, it, it's in that spirit to say, yes, okay, America, uh, 
what a diverse and incredible experiment in 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 human in, uh, you know an experiment in in society this country is but don't forget that the roots of this country lie in in the la in the land and in, with indigenous peoples on these lands mm. that's really exciting that we have that story map project to look forward to Yes, I know it's you're... called, before I forget, it's called Living yes. Nations, Living Words, and it will be out as a Norton anthology in May. Living Nations, Living Words, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And for folks who are curious about the other anthology, that one is called When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. I have that one with me right here, and it's also beautiful, um, which you can get any of Joy's books with our partner bookstore um, where she is tonight, Magic City Books. And we have a link up on our event page. So I know that your work isn't done. It sounds like you're working on this story map. I've read that you're working on a musical play. Uh, mm -hmm. We were there when jazz was invented as well as another um, memoir. Can you tell us a bit more of, of any of these forthcoming projects? Anything you wanna share? Yes, there's that anthology, and then Poet Warrior Call for Love and Justice is my next memoir, which will be out. It's really about teachers and becoming a poet from uh, uh, another kind of angle from being a lot older, about what I've learned and what not to do, and, you know, and so on. And many of the teachers, I've had so many teachers of many kinds. And um, then a music album that I just, we just finished getting all the tracks in called I Pray For My Enemies. Mm. And it's a, kind of a Gil Scott here in Ishville and I sing and read po it's got poetry singing. Uh, I play saxes, soprano, alto sax, flutes. And um, we have two confirmed, uh, there's three confirmed guest artists. Uh, Peter Buck on, from R.E.M. will be playing on it. Uh, Mike McCready, Michael McCready from Pearl Jam. Uh, Raheem, what is his last name? Wonderful player. He's, anyway, it's the album and it's being produced by uh, Barrett Martin, who also has contributed a lot to that album, who is part of Screaming Trees and uh, has uh, produced, he's a producer and, and uh, and writer and so, composer and so on. So That's that so will be exciting. out. And then my project, this is all in the works, that will be out in March 5th. And then I'm going back to work on this musical project with the Tulsa Artist Fellowship Arts Integration Grant here in Tulsa. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Before we move to our Q&A portion of the night, I'll ask you to read us one more poem and I'll also remind our audience that um, you are welcome to mail in, email in your questions to mayiask at uw.edu for that Q&A portion about to start. But before we go into that, I would love it, Joy, if you could read us your poem, A Map to the Next World, which was initially published in a book of the same title and can also be found in your collection, We Became Human. Yeah, a map to the next world. I wrote this when, uh, for my granddaughter, Desiree Kira Chi. I actually include this in the memoir, too, talking about when she was born and the time before she was born. And what I've always heard is that, I mean, it's common sense, too, that when a child is forming, it's important, you know, all these, everything is going, history is going into the making of that child. Um, it's not a lot like making a poem, history and, and plants and what's going on and, and, and the people. So it's important to, to, um, speak well when you're around, you know, for the family to get themselves together and, and prepare for this new life. That's kind of like what we're doing here in this country. You're going to prepare for, mm. you know, prepare for, uh, I guess for, uh, we, we should all, we're always preparing to make a play, the next place for the next generation. And so I was listening to thinking about what this girl was coming into. And one of the stories going around, I was living in Albuquerque then, and my granddaughter's half Navajo, and one of the stories going around in the Navajo community was about a, uh, how a holy being had come and spoken to 
a blind woman and told her that we had to remember, it was important to remember those teachings that were given to us as human beings, those teachings that teach us how to direct, interact directly with the earth and with the waters and act respectfully like you would with any beloved relative. And, and um, I remember giving this introduction uh, in Flagstaff recently, and there was a woman that came up after, and she said, I was there. I saw the footprints of the holy, the holy being. The holy being had long, narrow feet. Mm. But this was a poem to thinking about her and kind of helping her with a map. Map to the next world. In the last days of the fourth world, I wished to make a map for those who would climb to the hole in the sky. My only tools were the desires of humans as they emerged from the killing fields, from the bedrooms and the kitchens. For the soul is a wanderer with many hands and feet. The map must be made of sand and can't be read by ordinary light. It must carry fire to the next tribal town for renewal of spirit. In the legend are instructions on the language of the land and how it was we forgot to acknowledge the gift as if we were not in it or of it. Take note of the proliferation of supermarkets and malls, the altars of money. They best describe the detours from grace. Keep track of the errors of our forgetfulness. The fog steals our children while we sleep. Flowers of rage spring up in the depression. Monsters are born there of nuclear anger. Trees of ashes wave goodbye to goodbye and the map appears to disappear. We no longer know the names of the birds here how to speak to them by their personal names. Once we knew everything in this lush promise. What I am telling you is real and is printed in a warning on the map. Our forgetfulness stalks us, walks the earth behind us, leaving a trail of paper diapers, needles, and wasted blood. An imperfect map will have to do, little one. The place of entry is the sea of your mother's blood, your father's small death as he longs to know himself in another. There is no exit. The map can be interpreted through the wall of the intestine, a spiral on the road of knowledge. You will travel through the membrane of death, smell cooking from the encampment where our relatives make a feast of fresh deer meat and corn soup in the Milky Way. They have never left us. We abandon them for science. When you take your next breath as we enter the fifth world, there will be no X, no guidebook with words you can carry. You will have to navigate by your mother's voice, renew the song she is singing. Fresh courage glimmers from planets and lights the map printed with the blood of history, a map you will have to know by your intention, by the language of suns. When you emerge, note the tracks of the monster slayers where they entered the cities of artificial light and killed what was killing us. You will see red cliffs. They are the heart, contain the ladder. We were never perfect, yet the journey we make together is perfect on this earth who was once a star and made the same mistakes as humans. We might make them again, she said. Crucial to finding the way is this. There is no beginning or end. You must make your own map. Hmm. Thank you for this gift, your beautiful poems and reflections. I'm going to stop hogging the questions and transition us to some questions from our audience. I'll remind those tuned in that you can email your question to mayiask at uw.edu. And I see we have some questions in already. Thanks to our amazing public lectures team feeding me the questions. Uh, first one I'll ask you is, what advice would you give to young activists and natives today, given your knowledge as a creative and an elder? Well, one thing you can, um, you just, you have, to, it's important to stay focused on where you're going. And to believe there are so many, there's, there are so many <laughs> false narratives, I hate to use that word, <laughs> that would send you, a raw, send you astray, but it's important. I think what I've been taught by many different teachers is, I think one of the, actually one of the most profound teachings, and it sounds so simple, 
was uh, given to me was to be yourself. And I remember that, this, uh, it was a friend who was, a, she was a healer and a storyteller and a teacher. And I was going through, you know, through the years, I felt like giving up. I have given up momentarily and thought, you know, I was wasting my time. Nothing was, you know, I would, how is anything ever going to change? And, you know, we all hit that place of despair. And uh, mm. you have to keep going, for one. I've kept going. And two, I mean, there's some, I keep thinking of so many things. Two, but what she said is to be yourself. And I keep unpacking that through the years. Be yourself. At first I thought, well, of course I'm myself, you know. That's the young person thing. Well, of course I'm myself. But through the years, it becomes the question, the, the, it becomes more and more profound. Like, what does it mean to be yourself? What does it mean to be yourself? And then you wind up, you always wind up back with the land. You wind up with the plants. You wind up with the water. You wind up connected with your neighbor. You wind up realizing you're a planet. You're not a separate being. You're a planet. Mm. Being yourself, if you follow that journey of being yourself, it, it will take you... Uh, sometimes you might even be in opposition to everything you've loved or everyone and you have to continue being yourself because you've brought something everybody has brought something that the story needs you are here you have a place in the story everybody has a place in the story and you have something you have something really important everyone has something that they were carrying in to give to the story and to be part of you know we're all part of the story and that's important to remember that hmm. that's one part of the answer that would take, <laughs> that would take <laughs> we could be here all night for the rest yes. yeah that's a great question and a beautiful answer too i'll be holding that see other questions coming in here um, another question that's sort of an advice maybe oriented question but um, wondering how are you staying healthy and sane during these trying times yeah i thought i'd been pretty sane in the last week or so it's been it gotten a little rugged but what i've done as you can see i've been writing and making music and uh, and uh working on i've been doing a lot of work i always try to do something to move and being out in the earth it's been hard i feel like i'm in apartment weather but being outside and being by the water you guys have a lot of water really wonderful water and trees and beautiful land up there and uh, being where it's real you need to get out of the virtual stories into the real world that's a big one because mm. that world, that virtual world, whether it's internet, Netflix, all of that, it can trap you and steals time. It's really good time. You know, it steals time. So I've been trying to move out of that, you know, into back into the kind of space that uh, encourages that deep listening, that deep knowing. Mm. And I do a lot of dancing. I go downstairs. <laughs> I, uh, I have, I have a, I go dance cumbia with a woman who owns a shop downstairs when <laughs> there aren't a lot of customers. That's special. That's so special. That ties in a bit. Um, someone has asked a question about, you once said poetry helps you to move. The poetry helps you to move. Uh, the person asking this question says, I have cherished this beautiful thought. It seems life requires movement in order for one to feel its rhythm and be an alert partner. Do you find that your music enables this motion as much as your poetry? Well, the music's in the poetry. I mean, I often get asked about starting to write poetry, but it really came with the music. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've learned. I kind of have gone full circle and I first found poetry in my mother, you know, in the music. It was usually with music when I write, I feel that I'm a real big rhythm person. One other thing I've been doing during the pandemic is learning bass, but I'm always moving. 
and any alive system, whether it's a philosophical thought, a bio system, a system, there's a, you know, a system of living. It's important that there's movement and doorways in and out for something to be viable and alive. Mm. And uh, so, so that's one thought. And then the other is, yes, I mean, I, I think I probably, I realized I was reading something and I thought, I've arranged this poem. I'm, I'm basically playing uh, improvisational phrases even though I revise a lot, but I, I realize that a lot of the poetry, I mean, it, it, you, you just do the same things so whether you're writing poetry, music, or any, anything else. There's an architecture, there's phrasing. And yes, you can even say there's music and architecture. You know, there's ways of movement. And what is architecture? Well, it's how you move from here to here. Hmm. Uh, in a poem, well, it's how you move from here to here from one state of being to another, or one state of knowing to another. With the music, it's all about, ultimately about movement. Hmm. Looks like we have time for one last question. We have a couple here. Let's see. I think we can tie two of these together. Um, there's a question about what you're reading these days and also what international poets you may have found inspiration from over the years. And how long do we have? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I guess I should say, what are you reading these days? <laughs> well, I just picked up, I've just been looking forward to reading Kevin Young's and I was gonna get it during the break before we started his new anthology of, is it 250 years of African American poetry? Mm. And I just bought that. I've just been looking forward to that book. I've got stacks of things I'm reading. Linda Hogan has a new book of essays out. Uh, there's a book, a uh, biography of Frederick Douglass that's been sitting next to my bed that I'm trying to get to. There's a new one on Tecumseh that I just had the bookstore owner here at Magic City Books hold for me. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, there's uh, Kelly Jo Ford's new novel. There's a lot of what else am I reading? Um, Jake Skeet's Book of Poetry. Um, mm. I'm reading, there's a lot I'm reading. And Allie, you ask about poets from other countries? Yes, from everywhere. Um, who was it I had revisited from Chile? Oh, she won a Nobel. She was a, let me think of her name. But I started going back and reading her poetry, and then Ali Kobe Eckerman, an Australian, mm. Australian Aboriginal poet whose poetry I love. I love Robert Sullivan's poetry. He's uh, from uh, Aotearoa or New Zealand. There's, uh, like I mentioned before, let's see, um, and then there's a young woman out of India. I just can't, I'd have to sit in with a list. I mean, there's so much wonderful poetry going on. No kidding. Mm -hmm. The reading yes. stacks are endless. <laughs> yes, they are. We appreciate these these recommendations and a glimpse into your reading stack. It's It's been so phenomenal getting to speak with you, Joy. I really appreciate uh, your time and energy tonight. I know it's a few hours later there where you are. So thank you for joining us. And I um, want to thank our audience, too, for joining us tonight. And as we close out, I want to give a shout out to um, our whole UW Public Lectures team, Molly and Yvette, and our production team here, Frost and Richard, as well as the Tulsa-based production team at Magic City Books. Thank you to Pat, Bettina, and Baron. And I want to thank all of our audience, as well as Joy Harjo, for joining us tonight. And please note for folks who want to tune in for more public lectures, registration for winter quarter lectures opens on Wednesday, November 18th at uw.com backslash lectures. We hope to see you there. And again, we want to thank everybody who's tuned in tonight. Thank you for sending over questions. And thank you so much, Joy Harjo. Meadow, Take thank good you care. very much. Thank you. Yeah.